Hello and welcome to our daily Bible reading. We're continuing through the Psalms and we'll also be back in the book of Revelation, chapters 9 and 10. Let's pray. Father, as we look at these two very diverse parts of your word, I pray, Lord, that we'll see how your word is forming the box lid for us, that one picture of your plan of redemption. And that, Lord, as we read today, you'll, you'll inform our vision of that box lid picture of your plan. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, this is Psalm 131, a song of ascents of David. O Lord, my heart is not lifted up, my eyes are not raised too high, I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvellous for me, but I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Beautiful psalm of ascent. And as we've said, the psalms of ascent are when the worshippers back in ancient Israel would go up to the temple. They're ascending up the hill, up to the temple. All right, this is Revelation chapters 9 and 10. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth. And he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke, like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. And in those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. In appearance, the locusts were like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were what looked like crowns of gold, their faces were like human faces, their hair like women's hair, and their teeth like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like the breastplates of iron, and the noise of their wings was like the noise of many chariots with horses rushing into battle. They have tails and stings like scorpions, and their power to hurt people for five months is in their tails. They have, as king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit, his name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he is called Apollyon. The first woe has passed. Behold, two woes are still to come. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who were bound at the great river Euphrates, so the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard their number. And this is how I saw the horses in my vision and those who rode them. They wore breastplates, the color of fire and of sapphire and of sulfur, and the heads of the horses were like lion's heads, and fire and smoke and sulphur came out of their mouths. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and smoke and sulphur coming out of their mouths. For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents with heads, and by means of them they wound. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands nor give up worshipping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. Now this is going to sound pretty apocalyptic, literally. This is where the word apocalyptic comes from. It comes from this book. Apocalyptic meaning that it sounds like the end of the world. It sounds like it's being described in very poetic language. And indeed it is. 
It is being described in poetic language, but it's not the end of the world. But it was the end of something. And it was bringing about the end of the old covenant, the end of that, that dispensation, if you will, where it was the old covenant focused on the temple, the priesthood, the ceremonies and the sacrifices. We've already read in Isaiah the prophet that he accused the people of Israel, the people of Judah, of the things that we've just read here, sorceries, immorality, and especially idolatry. And when it talks about killing a third of mankind, again, we're looking at perspective. The perspective for a Hebrew in scripture, I've already shown you as we've gone through the scriptures, is that they will describe the events in, in their view as the whole earth. And so when they talk about a third of mankind, when, when John talks about a third of mankind, it's not a third of the global population. It's a third of the people of the land in that region. And so we can see from the writings of Josephus, who describes the siege of Jerusalem, the catapult attack by the Romans, the destruction that it wrought, the sounds that, that these catapult missiles brought, very, very reminiscent of what we're, what we're reading here in Revelation. So continuing, uh, continuing on in Revelation chapter 10. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head, and his face was like the sun and his legs like pillars of fire. He had a little scroll open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And called out with a loud voice like a lion roaring. And when the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write. But I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up what the seven thunders have said, and do not write it down. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it, that there would be no more delay, but that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. Then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me again, saying, Go, take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel who was standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, take and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it. It was sweet as honey, and when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And I was told, you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. Well, it's getting interesting now, but we can see that John was given a revelation of what was about to happen in his time. Because I remind you in the opening chapters, he has said, read this, you'll be blessed. Read this, you'll, you'll have insight. And we will go on to read in Revelation that he will say that with wisdom, you can understand some of the details that I've just given. And in this instance, it sounds like John was given a revelation of something that he wasn't to record in this book. But I presume that he would have shared it then and there, I presume. I can't be sure of that. But what I can be sure of is the time frame that Revelation itself gives for what we're now reading. It uses language like soon, now, at hand, this hour. And so that tells us that what John is writing about was not to take, what we've read so far, was not to take place thousands of years into the future and nor was it focused on the United States of America or even Europe but it was focused on the land of Israel. So with that in mind, I'm, I hope that you'll see that what John has already declared here in these first 10 chapters has been fulfilled. We've got a good historical reason for saying that it's been fulfilled, and I've written about this in my book, The Most Embarrassing Book in the Bible. And that's, a, that's a, an accusation that someone has made about the book of Revelation, and I'm, I'm responding to that. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you would grant those who've joined with me today in this daily Bible reading a relief, a fresh vision of how you have 
said something would happen, you said it would happen soon, and we can look back through the pages of history and see it was, it was fulfilled. You did bring the old covenant to an end. The temple was destroyed. What you unleashed as far as judgment on Jerusalem, what Christ spoke about, has indeed happened. And that, Father, you would give us a heart that says, Lord, we thank you for your, for your word that, that prophesied things. It clearly has been fulfilled. So now, Lord, we have great confidence in your word. We love you, we trust you, and we pray, Lord, guide us by the instruction of your word now, this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining with me today in this daily Bible reading. I can well imagine that I've provoked some questions. So if you do have questions, leave them there in the comment section if I can. Uh, and when I can, I'll get to them uh, and respond. If you haven't yet given this a thumbs up, please do. If you're not yet a subscriber, please subscribe. And you'll see me tomorrow for our next daily Bible reading.